So this is your second income tax call, uh, case and this is also on the topic of uh, revenue versus capital expense uh, and the deductibility of the two types of expenses. So here we have this, uh, let's just briefly go through the facts of this case. Empire Jute is a jute mill in West Bengal and then there is this um, agreement that is, uh, you know, uh, been made between these jute mills, uh, this is part of the uh, Indian Jute Mills Association, and uh, to counter the, uh, n uh, the adverse price effects uh, owing to an oversupply of jute in the world market, uh, this association of jute mills comes up with a uh, output restriction or an output control um, agreement, a scheme, uh, the idea being to restrict the supply and as you know from your basic economics, uh, if ceteris paribus, if uh, that is other things remain the same, if uh, supply decreases, then the price will increase. So this particular scheme, uh, by means of reduction of supply or a control of supply and prevention of oversupply, was meant to uh, counter the uh, uh, negative price effects of the oversupply in the in the world markets. So it's a very complicated agreement, but we don't need to focus on every aspect of it for this particular case what we really need to understand is two things one is that uh, essentially every mill was restricted uh, to a certain number of hours that they could work uh, per week and uh, uh, also uh, but there was also flexibility given to the uh, to, to the individual mills that if they did not want to work those hours that were allotted to them they could sell those uh, lumars uh, for they could sell those lumars to other mills and uh, the only condition being that uh, any sale of lumars or even the initial allotment of lumars they had to be uh, utilized during the particular week you could not carry forward any unused lumars from week to week that was one element and the second important element was that um, the uh, minimum tenor of any kind of uh, agreement to sell or transfer lumars between one mill and the other uh, would be uh, at least six months so these are the two important aspects of the agreement that we need to focus on and then and so what happens is so Empire Jute is one of those mills which is actually uh, ended up being a transferee in one of these uh, sale of Lumas transactions it has purchased Lumas from another mill and it has paid about approximately about 200,000 rupees uh, this is the exact amount that they have paid uh, for the accounting year this August 58 to July 59 and um, and what they have done is they have basically deducted this amount uh, claiming it as revenue expenditure on the ground that it was part of the cost of operating the looms and therefore the cost of running the business now one thing to note is that this case is happening uh, under the aegis of the 1922 income tax act although as you will see from the uh, citation of the case this is Supreme Court cases 1980 so this opinion is actually given by the Supreme Court in 1980 although the assessment here is you can see is um, 1958 uh, pertaining to 58 59 so the reason it is not under the 1961 income tax act is because it is uh, it pertains to an assessment here uh, to which the previous act which is the income tax act of 1922 was applicable that's why but it also shows you the fact that a 1958-59 assessment year case uh, or a 59-60 assessment year case is being heard by the Supreme Court finally in 1980 gives you some insight into how long it takes to push cases through the system and you understand why we have such a big lack backlog of cases uh, in the Indian uh, judicial system anyway so we go on to uh, let's just briefly look at the procedural posture of this case as you know uh, which we discussed in the something we discussed in the previous uh, case uh, the sequence the hierarchy through which Indian income tax cases have to move as you start with the assessing officer or the income tax officer sometimes called the income tax officer here all right okay then it goes to the Commission of Income Tax Appeals uh, then uh, sometimes that is the assistant or additional commissioner etc but essentially Com commission of income tax appeals then the income tax appellate tribunal then the high court and then to the supreme court 
so now this is what is in this particular case what has happened if we go to recap and so this case uh, so the initially the assessing officer uh, disallows this uh, deduction uh, taken by Empire Jute uh, but when uh, the assessee goes on appeal uh, to the um, to the assistant commissioner uh, appeals assistant commissioner income tax appeals he allows the claim of the assessee so the revenue loses at the CIT appeals le uh, level then the revenue appeals once again that is revenue is the tax department they appeal once again to the income tax appellate tribunal the tribunal also rules in favor of the assessee so the tax department goes further on to the high court now the high court is also the decision of the high court is actually quite interesting and as we shall see later the decision uh, of the Calcutta High Court in this particular case is just plain wrong. They have actually followed, uh, they have not followed the proper judicial form because they have not been sufficiently attentive to how exactly the rule of precedent should have been applied in the circumstances of this case. So anyway, what happens is the High Court is inclined to rule in favor of the uh, assessee, but then the High Court is presented with the precedent. Now this is a Supreme Court precedent. Uh, if you remember uh, when we studied Article 136 uh, of the Indian Constitution under the topic of stare decisis and binding precedence, uh, Article 136 of the, I'm sorry, not Article 136, uh, I forget the number of the article. I think it's, uh, uh, we'll check that. I mean, there is an article uh, in the Indian Constitution, uh, maybe 131. I have to check the exact number. Article 136 is for special appeals by special leave. It might be Article 131, uh, which lays down that the, which establishes that the law laid down by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts uh, in the country. And so, what the High Court has followed is that particular uh, dictum, and uh, applied this, uh, you know, basically applied the rule of stare decisis. Um, on uh, you know based on the CIT versus this Maheshwari Devi Mills case from 1965 now uh, what happened here was this is where the High Court of Calcutta has made a procedural error they have not been able to apply the rule of stare decisive properly and we'll come to that mistake when we address the questions in the case so the High Court essentially um, at this stage when we're just recounting the facts we can just note that the High Court ended up ruling against the assessee and in favor of the revenue. And so therefore you have Empire Jude bringing this appeal to the Supreme Court. Okay. Now, uh, let's have a look at the question. So in this particular case, we're not going to proceed so much uh, on the basis of the FILAC or IRAC framework, which we have historically applied. But I would rather go through the questions that were asked to you uh, in, in the case. Okay, while for, for, for your class discussions. So we'll, I'm going to attack the second question first. Okay, the second question was it had two parts. That uh, when you, the court extracts this particular, I took an extract from the judgment where the court refers to a double fallacy. So the first question was, which is the case that the court is referring to uh, when it talks about the double fallacy? So the answer to that part is fairly simple. It's this case called CIT versus Maheshwari Devi Jute Mills which is a Supreme Court case from 1965 which uh, ended up convincing the High Court to rule in favor of the uh, Income Tax Department. So this is the case, this is the first part of your answer to, I mean, after the second question. Now, the more important part of the answer is, what is the double fallacy that the Supreme Court is talking about? Okay, now let's go back to what I recounted in the facts of this case. Now, this, the High Court took this case as a binding precedent and ruled in favor of the Income Tax Department. Now, when the Income Tax Department is arguing the appeal before the Supreme Court, uh, in the present case, what the revenue is saying, what the Income Tax Department is saying is um, here. What the Income Tax Department is saying, so in that particular case, uh, in the Maheshwari Devi Jute Mills case, essentially, the court ruled that the uh, that was for basically that was a case where you had a seller okay you had in this case uh, Empire Jude is a buyer of Lumas and in that particular case in the Maheshwari Devi Mills case there was a seller of Lumas who wanted to um, you know exclude uh, who wanted to es essentially exclude uh, this uh, the money received 
from the sale of Lumas from their business income because they wanted to contend that this was a capital receipt. And in that particular case, uh, my, uh, the income tax department was contending that uh, it was actually a uh, revenue receipt and therefore this uh, receipt uh, that uh, came into the hands of uh, the receipt that uh, materialized in the hands of Maheshwari Devi Mills uh, was a revenue receipt and therefore should be part of their business income. In this particular case, in the Maheshwari case, the income tax department lost the case and the Supreme Court ruled that no, this was actually in the nature of a, a capital receipt and therefore should not be included as part of the assessee's income. So now what the revenue is doing is Okay, so as you can see here, this is what I just covered, that uh, in that particular Maheshwari case, the uh, income tax department lost because the High Court, uh, because the Supreme Court ruled that uh, this was in the nature of a capital receipt and not a, uh, and therefore not taxable, not part of the business income of the SSE. So now uh, it, uh, so what, what the revenue is doing in this particular case is they are now citing this Maheshwari Devi case and uh, saying that since in that particular case it was ruled that uh, uh, proceeds from the sale of Lumas in the hands of the transferer were in the nature of a capital receipt therefore symmetrically it follows that expenses incurred by a uh, transferee uh, in paying the consideration for the sale of Lumas or the transfer of Lumas were also a capital expense and not a revenue expense and therefore in this particular case of Empire Jute this being a capital expense they should not be uh, it should not be allowed at a, as a deduction in the computation of business income this was the contention of the revenue and this is where the court is saying that this argument suffers from a double fallacy so what are the two fallacies that are what I, this is what I asked you in the second part of the question okay so the first part of the second second question which is 2.2.1 um, well this actually should be um, yeah the double fallacy is as question 2.1 question 2.2 is actually on uh, the double fallacy what is the double fallacy so we should write this properly here question 2.2 deals with what is a double fallacy and the first of those fallacies is 2.2.1 okay which is the first fallacy is that uh, what the revenue seems to be assuming okay it's a suppressed premise in the revenues argument that um, just because something is a capital receipt in the hands of the payee uh, it must necessarily be a capital expenditure in, in the hands of the, uh, you know, in the books of the payer. So this, this is not necessarily true. And uh, this is the first fallacy that the Supreme Court uh, talks about. And in this case, uh, to establish this, they have, uh, to support their contention, they have quoted uh, uh, Lord McNaughton in uh, the race course betting control board versus wild case okay where he has also made a similar statement it's a 1938 case uh, notice that this is an english law case this is an english case okay so you'll notice here how the um, how in indian tax uh, uh, litigation uh, we frequently cite english australian u.s uh, tax cases when we are discussing uh, you know simple common law principles or fundamental common law principles so there's no problem in citing this course these, these kinds of precedents even though they are from different jurisdictions they are still taken as uh, authoritative statements of the law okay so this is the first fallacy that you cannot symmetrically infer that uh, uh, infer what the revenue has inferred in this particular case okay so that's your first fallacy the second fallacy is the more important one okay which is we're going to spend more time on that which is that in this particular case if you look at how Maheshwari Devi the Maheshwari Devi case uh, progressed okay this is very important okay so the question essentially that this because in the very early stages of the case itself uh, 
the fact that Lumas or the contention that Lumas were a capital asset was agreed to by both parties. So the question of whether Lumas were a capital asset or not was never debated. Okay, so you can see here I've extracted the um, relevant portions of the Supreme Court judgment. And this is the principle that we are talking about here, a very important principle to understand. And uh, this is a subtle point made by the court, but a very important point that a case is only a precedent for issues because remember, the revenue seeks to make the Meshwari Devi Jute Mills case a binding precedent. The revenue seeks to make this a binding precedent in the Empire Jute Mills case. Now, the Supreme Court does not agree with them. And why do they not agree with them? Because of the rule that, because of the principle that a case is only a precedent for issues that were in dispute in that case and were finally dis decided by the courts therein. Let me add a few words here. A dispute in that case and were uh, finally decided on the merits. This is important, on the merits, which means there's a full uh, argument and counter argument. There's a consideration of those arguments by the court and then there is a decision on the merits. So it's a, it's a proper uh, decision. It's not a dismissal of the case on, in limine, that is at the beginning itself. Uh, so we call this a decision on the merits. Okay, now, so therefore, uh, this is the important principle uh, that the Supreme Court is applying here. If you want to apply a case as a precedent for, a, for deciding a particular issue, you have to show that that particular issue was actually, uh, you know, in contention in that particular case. If it is an issue that was never even debated in that case, then then that particular precedent cannot be an authority on that particular issue, okay? Which is why the court is pointing out, this is something which the Calcutta High Court failed to notice. The court is pointing out that this case proceeds on the basis that both parties agree from the very outset that Lumas are a capital asset. So there's no debate. So look at this, look at what the court is saying here. All right, so it was decided, okay? Therefore, okay, so there was, I'm not going into the details of the contention here, but the point is that essentially uh, we can look at it briefly, okay? Since it was commonly accepted that Lumars were an asset, okay, nobody, dis neither party disputed this. The only argument was that this, okay? So revenue, so the argument in that particular case, Maheshwari Devi case, was only a question of whether this amount, this transaction, which is the sale of Lumars, amounted to a transfer of a cap or a sale of a capital asset, or uh, the mere loan of a capital asset by, uh, you know, letting it out to another, to the transferee, uh, and earning revenue, uh, you know, on account of that letting out. And in this space particular case, because there's no dispute about the fact that uh, Lumas were a capital asset or an asset. So in this particular case, the court decided that this, because there's no, you can't, um, so the revenue started some, uh, cited some uh, general principles, which are not in dispute, but they don't apply to the case. Okay. So the Supreme Court concluded that this was really a case of sale of Lumas and not of exploitation of Lumas. Uh, because obviously uh, you cannot uh, retain ownership uh, in okay this is the part which is so we are getting into the insides of the Maheshwari Mills uh, case decision which is probably not a bad thing to do to understand exactly what was decided in this case this is all this analysis which the Supreme Court is doing here should have been done by the Calcutta High Court and the Calcutta High Court should not have applied the Maheshwari Mills case as a precedent because they should have understood this element of sub silentio which they have totally failed to understand in this case we're going to discuss this case uh, further okay so what happens both parties agree that capital lumas are an asset or a capital asset all that they're arguing about is one is saying no this is just a sale of an asset an outright sale of an asset and the tax department is saying no this is not an outright sale of an asset you just lent the asset out for a while and earned some money on it so this is actually a revenue um, you know uh, receipt in the Mahesh Premal's case but the Supreme Court obviously disagrees uh, 
this is the argument that happens and the Supreme Court says that this so obviously it's, if it is if you accept the fact that they are Lumars and an asset in the Maheshwari Mills case they could not from their be nature, very nature be let out while retaining property in them here property again is being used in the sense of rights of ownership okay so therefore uh, if you are going to accept that Lumars are an asset and you're only going to fight about whether this particular transaction of sale of Lumars or a transfer of Lumars amounts to a sale of a capital asset or a renting out of a capital asset it's obviously a sale of a uh, capital asset so this is what was decided in the Meshuri Mills case so what the court is now saying is if you look at this yeah the entire case that is the Meshuri Mills case the only issue debated was whether uh, Okay. this the only issue debated is this okay no question was raised before the court as to whether Lumas so whether Lumas were an asset at all nor was any argument advanced as to what was the true nature of the transaction so when you look at the transaction it's the sale of Lumas okay the point is that the in the Meshri Mills case the Supreme Court did not was not called upon to dwell upon the nature of the transaction they were not called upon to decide the question of whether Lumas were an asset because the two parties had already agreed on that point okay so here we say now I take you back to our old Glanville Williams article so is this clear if you remember this before I introduce the term sub silentio let's just go back to a simple statement of a logical point it should be obvious to anybody that a case can only be a precedent a judgment can only be a precedent for issues that were actually in dispute in that case were finally decided on the merits by the court therein so if some issue is not really in dispute in the case and has never been argued that particular case is not a precedent for that issue okay even if it's a Supreme Court case this is the point that the Calcutta High Court totally failed to grasp now the technical term for this is what is called sub silentio okay let's go back to our Glanville Williams article You'll notice when I gave you the initial Glanville Williams article called Learning the Law. I asked you to omit the last paragraph dealing with the concept of sub silentio, a decision sub silentio. Okay, so what he says, a decision sub silentio is not binding. This is what the Calcutta High Court failed to realize, and therefore they made the mistake of taking the Maheshwari Mills case as a binding precedent that applied to the Empire Jute Mills case which is not the correct decision it's a procedural uh, error that the court has made okay and it's being corrected by the Supreme Court now what is a decision so, so now we're going to learn about sub silentio if I initially if I uh, remember if you remember in your initial reading I had asked you to omit sub silentio because it's a complex topic and I was going to discuss this later in the connect in connection with this case so now you see a very good example of what is meant by sub silentio sub silentio is nothing but this it's it's another way of looking at this uh, when we talk about this here okay the same point that if a court it's a related point essentially very similar point that a case is only a precedent for issues that were actually in dispute and decided on the merits by the court uh, therein okay so look let's look at this now if you take this example now you've already got a detail of the Maheshwari Devi Mills case in the case how do we apply the logic or the uh, terminology sub, of sub silentio uh, on uh, with respect to the Maheshwari Mills case so remember this is a case where uh, both parties started out by agreeing that Lumars were a capital asset or an asset okay and uh, both parties therefore did not really want to dwell uh, or argue about the nature of the transaction uh, that is the sale of Lumars so therefore we say and so what the court did not decide these two important points in the Maheshwari Devi Mills case because they, it was, they were not in dispute between the parties. So therefore we say that the Maheshwari Devi Mills case, the decision in that particular case passes subs or passed sub silentio on the questions of one, whether Lumas were an asset at all and two, what is the true nature of the transaction that is the sale of Lumas. Okay, so this is very important to understand. So this is where you understand the theoretical point
about sub silentio because again this is related to the entire discussion on Sarah story decisis story decisis you have the concept the related concepts of binding and persuasive precedence now um, I'm just looking for a sale of Mumars so that I can just copy paste it somewhere okay so anyway the transaction is the sale of blue mars okay let's do it this way when i say transaction what i mean is the sale of blue mars so what is the true nature of this transaction this question was never really dealt on i mean uh, was not never really dealt upon by the supreme court in the meshri devi mills case so therefore that decision passes sub silentio on these two important issues whether Lumars were an asset at all. So therefore, the Supreme Court says this is a second fallacy, okay? The second fallacy that the uh, tax department is engaging in. And so the court says, okay, this these questions were never addressed. So therefore, okay, this decision, Maheshwari Devi Mills, cannot be regarded as an authority compelling us to take the view that the amount paid for the purchase of Lumars was capital and not revenue expenditure. The question is res integra and we must proceed to examine it on first principle. Res integra means uh, that uh, it needs to be, it's, it's a central issue still. It is not something which has already been decided. It's a central issue still and needs to be uh, discussed and, and decided. Okay. So this is the, the answer to your second question, which is uh, the question of uh, what, what are the two fallacies. Okay. And in which case did you get this? In which case were the court referring to when it talked about the two fallacies? And so you learn this other important point, which is also related to the topic of stare decisis. So th uh, when we say stare decisis, we talk about binding precedence. What the Supreme, what the Calcutta High Court, understand the error of the Calcutta High Court in this case. Although, according to the Constitution, decisions of the Supreme Court are binding upon the, all the other courts in the country. However, the legal theory legal theory tells us okay on the topic of stare decisis that a decision sub silencio is not binding okay on those issues on which that decision has passed sub silentio. so therefore the calcutta high court should have understood that uh, notwithstanding the fact that Maheshwari, the Maheshwari devi mills case is a supreme court case on a very on this very similar issue that uh, very similar to what has arisen in the empire jute mills case but it is actually a decision that is passed sub silentio on the important questions of whether Lou Mars were an asset and on what is the tr true nature of the transaction uh, that is the sale of Lou Mars. And therefore, the Calcutta uh, High Court should not have applied uh, the Maheshwari Mills case as a binding precedent and uh, decided the Empire Jude case uh, using that precedent. Okay, so this is a, a error that was made by the Calcutta High Court. So you learn the concept of sub silentio. I've also given you a um, hyperlink to a note on sub silentio. You can read a little bit more about it. This is explained in this classic work on jurisprudence, Salmon on jurisprudence. So you can read this. This is taken from this particular case, Hami Joran versus Abdul Salam. Then there's another case which again refers to it, Lakshmi Printing Works, which there's a hyperlink there. Okay, once again, it's referring to the same case and it talks about another case. And as you can see here, uh, a very good example of uh, sub silentio decision is uh, uh, appearing in the Maheshwari Devi Mills case as applied to the Empire Jude case. So this is just a reference for you to understand sub silentio in greater detail. So all these topics are connected. Stare decisis. Uh, the rules, I mean, the principle, uh, the concept of distinguishing, sorry, decisis, binding and persuasive precedence, horizontal and vertical precedence. And then when somebody tries to apply a precedent uh, in an adversarial uh, situation, uh, in adversarial litigation in common law countries, your job as the other advocate, other sides, uh, uh, so other sides counsel is to try and distinguish that case either in a non restrictive way that is based on facts or in a restrictive way where you would try to cut down the ratio of the case and argue that the ratio was unnecessarily wide in the precedent that is being cited.
of course then it would have to go to a larger bench etc but you can always make that point and the other kind of a distinguishing that you can do is not really distinguishing but it is to point out the fact that this is not going to be a binding precedent because which is what the supreme court has done very well in this particular case that it's actually arguing on behalf of empire jute this point should have been brought up by empire jute's counsel in the supreme court that this particular case, the Maheshwari Devi Mills case, is a decision that passed sub silentio on those two important questions. Right? On these two important questions. One and two. And therefore, so this is another thing that counsel should be able to do to understand. When, what is the issue in uh, that is in contention in their case and does the precedent that was cited does the de decision in that precedent okay if you can't distinguish it in any way does the decision in this precedent actually pass sub silentio or has has it passed sub silentio on the real questions that are in issue in your case okay if you can't show that then you can establish that this particular precedent is not going to be binding because it is a decision sub silentio on the core issues in the current case. It's a very important point to understand from a litigation perspective. All right, now we'll go back to, uh, the, we are handling the questions in reverse. We're going to go back to the other question that was asked to you. Now, this is where the second part, which is referring to section 10 to uh, 15 of the 1922 Income Tax Act but talking about allowable deductions, okay? It, uh, it, in order for a deduction to be allowable, it has to be incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of his business. And it further has to be a revenue expense, not a capital expense, okay? Now, what does the court do here? How does the court decide? Notice that what is here, what is happening here is there is something that is mentioned here at the very beginning that the first one was um, okay I'm trying to but anyway uh, we don't need to go and find the exact part in the case where that appears but the point is in this particular case the facts are such that this element the revenue the tax department never disputed the fact that the purchase, the money paid as consideration for the purchase of Lumas was an expenditure incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of Empire Jude's business. So this point was not in dispute. And the only point that the revenue disputed was that rev uh, the tax department argued that this is not a expense of a revenue nature, it's an expense of a capital nature. So therefore, this is the only issue that the court is going to uh, opine on in this particular case. And how do they go about doing this? We can once again go back a little bit to our FILAC Iraq framework and look at the legal principles that they apply. They've gone through a lot of uh, they've this. This particular judgment is important because it goes through a lot of important uh, historical decisions on the principles on the questions of, uh, you know, on, on the question of how to determine whether some expenditure is uh, revenue of capital nature. So I'm not going to go through them in detail. But the first rule, that is the enduring benefit test, Lord gave in uh, Atherton versus British Insulated and Hallsby Cables, uh, where he's talked about the enduring benefit test. But again, he's left a little loophole. He said that, okay, this will apply in the absence of special circumstances, etc., which has again been seized upon by Lord Radcliffe in this Commission of Taxes versus uh, Nchanga Copper Mines uh, case. And you can see all these discussions, and uh, so obviously he. The, so the important distinction is that it's not just that there should be an endure, enduring benefit, which is the um, test given to us by Lord Gave, but um, there is a refinement and a narrowing, uh, explicit refinement and narrowing of the uh, Atherton uh, versus British Insulated Cables case of the ratio in that case. And the enduring benefit test, which is being refined and narrowed by Lord Gladcliffe in the Commission of Taxes, which is Enchanga Mines, Copper Mines. Okay, um, 
where he's talked about even you know expenditure laid down for maintaining capital equipment would also be a revenue expenditure but mainly he's laid down the rule that it need not just it doesn't have to be just a it is not sufficient for it to be something that renders an enduring benefit but the benefit has to be uh, in the capital field okay that is essentially what they have not spelt out so well is that there needs to be some kind of enhancement either qualitative or quantitative enhancement of the capital stock okay of the business now if you look at um, so they've given some of these other discussions okay now this the supreme court has touched upon some elements of that which is no enlargement of the permanent structure of which the income would be the produce of fruit produce of fruit this is exactly what i said just now which is an enhancement either a qualitative or quantitative enhancement of the capital stock okay using which you end up producing the products or services that you are delivering okay so essentially this is a long discussion that the court has you can test this in other ways so suppose you have if you test for capital stock increase you have 10 machines now which are able to produce 10 tons of sugar per minute now if you uh, are only allowed under the lumars uh, restriction argument uh, agreement uh, to operate your looms for six hours a day now six hours a day your 10 machines can only produce 10 hours of sugar per minute okay in this case we are assuming it's a sugar mill okay so if you have a restriction on the operation of sugar mills so you can only produce uh, 10 hours of sugar 10 tons of sugar per minute now there's an improvement to the capital stock only if there's some kind of productivity improvement either you increase the capital stock so you have more than 10 machines so you can actually produce at the rate of more than 10 tons of sugar per minute or you're able to have some kind of capital improvement which allows you to produce higher quality products at the same time at the same direct cost okay but there is a capital improvement that allows you to do this so these are all elements of what i call quantitative or qualitative enhancements to the capital stock okay which would uh, not only render a not only be uh, conducive to an enduring benefit okay or not only would confer a, an enduring benefit on the corporation but they would also satisfy the second test laid down by lord radcliffe in the enchanga copper mines case which is that there has to be a benefit in the capital field okay so this is the essential principle they have laid down uh, they have discussed a few other cases as well that is john smith and sons okay versus more then uh, i think there was another case that was discussed uh, there's a long so so you have a couple of other cases Hallstrom's property Robert Addy and sons you can go through some of these discussions but mainly now we come to the question that I asked you what were the two precedents that the court directly used to decide this case the first is the Commissioner of Taxes versus in Changa consolidated mines okay here you have a uh, sort of a output restriction argument uh, agreement between three companies and two companies uh, will carry out the agree to carry out the restricted output you know to basically um, take charge of producing the restricted output and the third mill uh, the third mine is actually shut down but the third money is paid the third uh, mine is paid a certain amount of money uh, for uh, keeping the mills shut down as a part of its share of the revenues uh, from the restricted uh, uh, output restriction agreement and then the payee the payee that has paid this amount seeks to claim this as a deduction you can see the discussion of this case here here the assessee paid to company this was the question in the Inchanga consolidated copper mines case as you can see it's very similar to the facts of the Empire Jude case and the Privy Council okay this obviously is a case from the Commonwealth Territories came to the Privy Council and the Privy Council held that um, okay that uh, compensation paid by the SSE um, you can see here the same principles apply in most of the common law countries okay uh, nature of revenue expenditure therefore allowable as a deduction okay so now there's a detailed explanation of this uh, decision so this is the first precedent that is applied by the uh, by the supreme court to decide the empire jute mills case uh, 
the Inchanga Consolidated Copper Mines case. And then there's a second case, this Commission of Taxes versus Canon, Canon Company, you know, also an English case. This is a case originating in, originating in England proper. So you can see that it's actually decided by the House of Lords and not the Privy Council. So uh, here again, you can see the company obtains a revised charter, eliminating some uh, impediments to the uh, running of the assessee's business. Therefore, this is held to be a revenue expenditure and it's allowed as a deduction. So these are the two cases that, uh, so you can read these a little bit uh, uh, more uh, in, in a little bit more detail on your own. These are the two cases used by uh, the Supreme Court to decide this particular case. Okay, so uh, as you notice, these are both actually, f uh, neither of these is an Indian judgment, but they're, but they're still, but you still see the Supreme Court using them uh, as precedents to decide a particular case uh, in India. So this is, uh, this finishes the treatment of this particular case. And then eventually the court rules in favor of the uh, assessee, that is Empire Jute. Okay. So this case is notable for a few, th uh, a few things. So one is that the extensive discussion of the theoretical um, uh, literature that exists in, in all the in the in the common law domain in the form of various judgments on the question of how to decide whether something is a revenue expense or a capital expense and the other important point about this case is the very important uh, very crucial procedural error made by the Calcutta High Court in failing to understand that the Maheshwari Devi Mills case had passed sub silentio on the important issues that were in contention in the Empire Jute Mills case and that therefore the Calcutta High Court should not have allowed, should not have applied uh, the Maheshwari Mills case as a binding precedent in the Empire Jude case, even though it was a decision of the Supreme Court. All right, that ends our discussion for this case.